Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode four. Welcome back. We're doing our expert assessment series, and this is episode four where we're exp uh, exploring key insights and findings from our Delphi survey. We've got an awesome panel lined up for today's discussion, and you can find a full slide deck of this in our Coronavirus Resource Center. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, please be sure to hit your comments in that chat box, and we'll be answering questions towards the end of the session. And if you haven't done so yet, um, subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you can get more content like this. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the session. I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ockerstern, who's moderating today's session. Peter. Thank you, Chris. And uh, a warm welcome to this webinar for me as well. The future of work post COVID-19, the experts assessment episode four. The idea behind this series of IFMA webinars is to focus on the research that IFMA has provided and bring you close to the experts to share insights and conclusions from the, from the research. Um, this is the fourth episode of the series. The first was held in September, uh, focusing on workplace strategy and the conclusions from that. Um, you can find a recording of all previous sessions and the, on, at the IFMA website or on YouTube, as Chris already said. Uh, there will also be a link in the show notes. My name is Peter Ankerstjern. I'm the chairman of IFMA's Board of Directors, and I'll be your host uh, for today's session. So in today's webinar, we'll focus on presenting and discussing some of the findings and conclusions from our um, experts' assessment study, especially um, focused around um, the, the future of the, uh, the facilities in demand post-COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> the Delphi survey is really the first survey of its kind within the FM industry, uh, and also the first survey using subject matter experts uh, in understanding uh, the consequences of the global pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, we still still sort of are in the middle of that pandemic, uh, and we still have a, a way to go before we can um, get to the end of this. But, but at least there's hope with the vaccine now uh, being rolled out. I should say the survey report is available on the IFMA website, uh, and there's also a free uh, executive summary, uh, which is quite detailed uh, and, and very good to uh, sort of dig into. Um, let me just start by introducing it. We have a really great power panel um, here. Again, and if some of you joined the webinar in September, you will see that it's the same panel. We felt that it was a really good and dynamic discussions we had. So we took the liberty of inviting them back in. So I'm, I'm very proud to share uh, some of these experts that we have with us today. And the first one is Kay Sargent. Uh, Kay worked uh, as a senior principal and director of workplace at HOK and is really an ec recognized expert on workplace design and strategy issues. Next up, we have Dr. Marie Pubereau. Uh, Marie is head of global research as, at JLL and is part of the IFMA EMEA advisory board and is also a recognized thought leader within corporate real estate and FM, especially focusing on the future of work and human experiences. Then we have Luis Arevinha. Luis is Alliance Director at CBRE, covering the LATAM region. Uh, Luis has a long entrepreneurial expertise uh, and has also advised a series of startups in the prop tech sector. He is part of IFMA's America's advisory boards, uh, IFMA technology community, and also part of the Cornet Mexico chapter board. Last but certainly not least, uh, we have Jeff Saunders. Um, Jeff is executive advisor at Futurist. He's the CEO of Nordic Foresight and is the IFMA work, uh, workplace evolutionaries uh, Denmark hub leader. Um, Jeff specializes in applying future research methodologies, including the scenario planning and behavioral science to solve challenges for large organizations, both public and private. Uh, Jeff is really the author and initiator of the Delphi research study here. So welcome to all of you. And before we, we go in to the, uh, to the actual um, presentation and later on the debate, uh, I just want to make sure that the structure of today's webinar is in place so everybody knows what to expect. So we'll just do ultra short input on the methodology uh, to understand where this whole Delphi stuff comes from. Then Jeff will uh, spend about 10 minutes presenting some of the key findings of the study and we'll invite some of our panelists also to share some of their 
uh, findings also through their companies uh, because each of the companies, HOK, JLL, and CPRE, uh, are doing a lot of research in this field. So we felt it was a good idea to share some of this as part of the general presentation. And then we'll have a quick poll and then we'll go into the um, panel discussion and, uh, and, and share some insights on some of the key topics around facilities in demand. Um, the Delphi study, um, just very quickly, uh, it, was, it was introduced in, in detail in our earlier seminars back in 2020. So I will just browse through this very, very quickly. But the purpose of the surveys is really to understand how COVID-19 uh, have shaped and will shape our collective future through the crisis and of course, especially post-crisis as we get into some kind of a new normal uh, after uh, the vaccine has been distributed and, and is working. Um, what will the future look like after the pandemic and how will the crisis impact the future of work, workforce and workplace? <clears throat> we chose the real-time time Delphi approach uh, to obtain a variety of diverse in industry experts' perspectives and some of the key questions that we feel is, is relevant in this particular uh, time. Um, and, and also uh, we felt that the Delphi service was particularly good when we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, which I think we can all agree that we are at this point in time. Nobody really know uh, what's gonna happen um, post pandemic. Um, but, but the Delphi provided an online platform where experts could share their views and opinions on some key questions and what we tried to do through this, the, the survey methodology really was to identify some consensus views and also some divergent op, uh, opinions and then dig more into this and have an online discussion uh, around this. So this methodology gave us a more curated view of what are some of the industry leading subject matter experts uh, view on key challenges that are facing the industry. Um, the, the outcome of this is, of course, to aid uh, or provide an aid in the decision making so we can help IFM members and other uh, FM um, interested people in, in, in terms of making some better decisions uh, and, and understand what are the opportunities and risks uh, related to work and the, especially the workplace uh, post, post COVID 19. The survey was done in collaboration with our uh, IFMAS six communities of practice, <coughs> which you can see on the screen. Um, we used their memberships and their connections to identify 650 industry leading experts, where of which uh, 250 provided input and worked with the survey. The communities also helped us to dissect and understand the inputs and the conclusions from the survey. Today's panel will reflect some of the conflicting views from the Delphi surveys within facilities in demand, and also act as an illustration of some of the discussions that we had online. So before we jump into the panel debate, I would like to give Jeff Saunders um, 10 minutes to share some of the highlights and conclusions from the research as we know it at this point of time. So Jeff, over to you. All right, Peter, thank you so much for the great introduction. And what we're going to be doing is contextualizing the findings of the Delphi um, survey with some of the events that have occurred since um, the last time we presented all together um, in October, but also um, since the survey itself was conducted. And one of the major um, factors, kind of the, the, the breaking point into a transition into a new era is the development of not just one, um, but several vaccines and actually the pipeline, um, as we see looking forward, of several potentially hundred different variants of the vaccine that could reach their way to the market. Um, so we hear often of, of two major ones, of course, the Pfizer Biotech uh, um, vaccine, also Moderna, the Oxford AstraZeneca, but there's also vaccines being developed in, in Russia and China that have entered the market. So we have um, some reason to be optimistic. We see far in the distance some light at the end of the tunnel where we actually could be making that transition later um, this year, depending on the market and the region um, by Q3, Q4 of 2021. And so it's good time to stop and reflect and ask ourselves, um, what's that next normal? 
What does it look like? How has our views changed um, since we've gone through not only one lockdown, but in many parts of the world, a second lockdown um, in, during the winter months? Um, if you look on the chart on the right, we have um, some of the statistics from this morning um, where we see the cumulative uh, overview of how many people have, have received the vaccine developments. And depending on the country, you have smaller countries like Israel and the UAE, um, where over 40% of the population in the case of Israel has received at least the first dose. Um, in a country like the UK, the number is around 10%. So we're making progress, but we have to also recognize, as Dr. Fauci in the United States um, has said, you know, there's a great deal of uncertainty about how many people need to actually be vaccinated for we actually are able to achieve herd immunity. Um, he's looking at 70 to 90%. So we have to start thinking about that next normal and what that journey to the next normal is. And so if we look on the next slide, we're seeing um, this view where we've been through the productivity challenges on the lower part um, of, of the slide. Um, where we're gone from that shelter in place, the workplace closures, many places the second to the third time, into a discussion about how do we improve our productivity with everything that we've learned from lockdown one and lockdown two, to now seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, beginning to plan that future vision for the next normal. And I think it's really exciting today that we have panelists representing various elements of the workplace community talking about how they're focusing upon it. But if we transition back to the Delphi itself, one of the key findings that our 250 subject matter experts coming from a wide variety of, of fields of expertise within the workplace community, everything from corporate real estate to um, devices and IT solutions and everything in between, um, what they are expecting is at least 81% um, 81%, uh, 81% of them expect at least 26% of remote workers will work most of the time from home. Um, studies that have been conducted later, um, next slide please, by um, McKinsey, um, estimate that um, four times as many people will work from home, which is about that 26% figure. They're estimating around 20%. And the reason why they're saying that, um, next slide please, is that there's varying degrees at which remote work can, or, or work can be done remotely. Not all of us, even knowledge workers, could work remotely. And depending upon the industry, you have different degrees uh, of, of work tasks or different elements of work tasks that could be done remotely. And so these figures that you, you see are all the different categories of work tasks and economists' expectations about the degree to which they could be um, done remotely. So the figures below 82 to 91 is an assessment of the percentage of the number of tasks that can be done remotely. And these depend greatly upon the industry that you're in. So some of these factors will be determined by the geography that you're in, but also others will be determined about the industry you're in and the type of leadership that you have. Next slide, please. So this has a great deal of implication on the facilities in demand. And so when we started discussing with our subject matter experts about how this transition to a greater use of remote work, 26% of our workforce working remotely, um, we need to start thinking about new types of working environments. Next slide, please. And what we're seeing from our SME panel is that 63% believe that organizations will make greater uses of uh, co-working sites, satellite offices, the hub and spoke model, new types of spaces, event spaces, and spaces we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and this next slide, please, um, leads us into questions about how will organizations integrate many elements into the hybrid working strategy. And what we're seeing is an ecosystem. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we see the aspects around working from home, um, which we're, many of us are doing now, most of us are doing now, um, transitioning into local working near home and local community hubs and things like that, maybe also transitioning into an event space moving forward. And then that question becomes, what are the central hubs that offices provide and how are they um, kind of managing together? And some of the consequences that came into that, which we explore in the Delphi is we have to start thinking about 
not only what responsibilities do employers have to their workers working um, from home, but we have to start thinking about that competition for talent. The war for talent hasn't ceased just because we have the pandemic. In many aspects, it's accelerated because some of the, the key competencies and skill sets that are required have only become strengthened. So the question is, what type of home services should we offer to remote workers? What type of competition are we seeing around them? Um, what type of working near home options are becoming available? How are headquarters and collaborative helps emerging? How are we thinking that event spaces will be leveraged? And what are some of the technology platforms um, that are emerging and integrating the above? And I think these are some of the key questions that we should have a conversation about. And with that um, brief little introduction, we'll come back to some of the findings as we move forward in the rest of our panel debate. I'd like to give the word over to Luis and he could tell us a little bit about how CBRE is planning to bring these elements together. Thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Peter and Ima, for the opportunity. So um, I think that uh, COVID uh, and all these um, close and situations we've had and, and uh, the impacts of the office, it's, it's, uh, it's been a catalyst. Uh, all the trends and all the changes we're seeing, it's not that they were not there before, they were, we were just taking our time, you know, to think about them and to implement them. Uh, I, I, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm showing a, a picture from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright of a building of 1900s, uh, sorry, of 1905. And uh, he, the, there's been a change of parodying in the way we leave the offices since the 90s, since the 90s. Some uh, businesses or some industries were uh, faster to implement them, some others were not that fast. And, and COVID has come to 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 accelerate and and uh, all the, all those trends. And uh, what, what's what's the key element we need to think about? What what we, what's the key question we need to make ourselves? And that, that is what's our business culture? What, what, what's the way we want to treat our employees? What's the way uh, we want to attract and keep talent? You know, what's, what kind of culture do we want we create with our office spaces? And, that, uh, and that's a strategy. That's, that's the, the, the strategy process. And in that strategy process, uh, the, the first stage is the workplace strategy. And, and there are several actors involved in there. Uh, I, the Fit Survey actually mentions it. HR should be involved in there, should be HR be leading the it. Uh, finance should be involved in there. Real estate should be involved in there. Uh, the business units, the business should be involved in there. So to 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 look at, hey, what kind of uh, workplace do we want to create? And the trends and what COVID has accelerated is, is we are moving to an agile and fluid activity-based workplace. That's obviously going to have some impacts like reducing space, not that much as some people say, but probably reduce, uh, we're going to be reducing space and probably re reusing it, redesigning it for a different purposes. That works uh, workplace strategy then defines the portfolio strategy. Once I know the kind of culture I, I want to create with my space, with my offices, what kind of physical spaces do I need are, and where do I need them? And uh, here comes what you've already mentioned, the club and hub concept. Uh, we're going to see uh, smaller uh, city uh, club centers, like the headquarters, smaller ones, with, with the purpose of, of uh, having clients come in, having teams meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then a group or uh, a few satellite offices in the same city or in suburban areas around the city for employees to be able to, you know, um, change between home, working from home and working from the office, <coughs> sorry, meeting, uh, working as a team, et cetera. That's gonna have an impact in, in, in suburban real estate scenarios. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see prices going up in some places, et cetera. And then once you've got your workplace and what kind of space you need, uh, okay, so how, how does technology enhance that? There's a trap when we talk about technology. The, 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 we, we've got the temptation to say, hey, how do I create a technology strategy? Hold on. How do you create a strategy and then how do you figure out how tech can enhance and can support that strategy? And we've got a lot of elements uh, supporting these agile and fluid and these club and hub concepts 
we've got um, artificial intelligence and with all the 5G technology coming over soon, collaboration technology, sustainability is going to be a big topic uh, in the coming years uh, regarding buildings, etc. Hosting technology, you know, make it, making it easy for someone coming into the office, making it easy to uh, make a reservation for, for a meeting room, <clears throat> etc. Then all CMMS and BMS uh, systems, uh, they're going to be enhancing these experience and, and these hosting apps, etc. And there's also a big opportunity in construction and design precisely between the link uh, of the developer and uh, the tenant. Uh, there, there's a big opportunity there uh, for those two big players getting together before the tenant comes into the building or rents that space. There's an opportunity there to design the, the building from zero with the tenant's feedback and uh, implication. And obviously, uh, 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 also a big player is going to be occupancy planning uh, related to uh, artificial intelligence and sensors. So that's kind of what we are seeing. As I, and, and, and as I was mentioning, COVID has come to accelerate all these trends that were already there, but that uh, we weren't uh, implementing them that fast. With that, I think, uh, Kay, you're next. Thank you. So uh, we, we've done a ton of research into this topic and had conversations with corporations and companies all around the world. And I think what we are also seeing is kind of this emerges, emergence of this hub home spoke model. And I actually have to say that this actually has been happening organically for over 20 years. So this is not a new concept. In fact, in, in the 1990s, Silicon Valley experimented with this. And I would argue at that point, they probably didn't have the technology and the capabilities to truly uh, to do it, but now we do, and there's multiple different reasons why. Um, you know, I think people are demanding more work-life balance. I think there is a huge focus on the impact to the climate and what commuting is doing for that. I think there are a lot of people that are that are looking for more options and choices because options and choices equal control. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's, I think, what people want. And so when we talk to CEOs, there's really kind of five things that are driving all of this today. The number one concern is health, safety, and the well-being of their, um, of their workforce. And a lot of that is risk aversion, but that is the number one concern today. And because if it wasn't, we'd all be sitting in, in the office. The second thing that uh, they're really grappling with is, okay, so what is, you know, we've done this work from home now, what does this ultimately mean? And what are the lasting ramifications? And how do we do this? And there's some pluses and some minuses. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the legislation that's starting to come out about this now and some of the hidden costs and things like that. But it also is is driving uh, the third thing on our list of the, of the five things that they're really focused on, which is, okay, well, what does this mean for the purpose of place? And I would argue that that is one of the things we really truly need to focus on. If we organically have been leading towards this hub home spoke model, what is different now? And, th and the difference now is that it's more commonly acceptable. And once it's accepted, then we need to start designing each one of these with intent and purpose. So what can the hub offer me that I can't get at my home? Because if you're not gonna give me something enticing, I'm not going to go. And so I think companies will actually at the end of the day might have smaller hubs, but that are built out to a higher level to create an amazing experience that really draws people to those places and offers them something compellingly different than what I can get at the spoke, which might be more community based and more casual, but I still connect with people and I might get better tools. And then, of course, the home, which might focus more on uh, no commute, uh, you know, more control of how you're spending your time and the, you know, the types of tasks that you're doing. So that's really, I think, what we're seeing emerge. And then, of course, the other two things that companies are really worried about today is business resiliency. Will they still be around and can they innovate fast enough? And I'm going to argue we're putting way too much focus on 
people being productive and having empty email boxes and not enough focus on social capital and connecting and innovation and, you know, and, and those types of things that really drive and fuel a company's future growth. And then the fifth bucket is ESGs, environmental, social, and governance. And we have to take this opportunity not just to address how COVID has impacted us, but how civil unrest and the demand for social equity is impacting us. And we have a unique opportunity now, I think, really to create environments that, again, go back to options and choices that give people more control. So we're creating environments and a work-life culture that is more welcoming and more accessible and more inclusive to the greater population. So Marie, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think we, we're all in, in, in agreement here that this shift towards a worker-centric model is, is extremely clear. I mean, today work is, is now seen as not somewhere you go to, but something that you do. So there's a more human-centric than ever. Uh, and the crisis, as uh, uh, Luis uh, you know, said, as, as given us an opportunity and, and a way to accelerate the transformation. So more than ever, we're seeing that the workforce will need to be front of mind you know, for uh, employers. So like Luis and uh, you know, Kay, for me, the hybrid uh, you know, workplace is about a combination of, of still going to an office, working from home, and potential also to work from anywhere. And that's where the whole notion of flex space you know, come into place. But the future of work is hybrid. Um, we will see with work from anywhere a drive towards more dispersion of the footprint. And clearly, um, uh, hybrid work is now the preferred way of working and what we call the new normal, the next normal, whatever name you want to, uh, you know, to give it. We know today that 70% of employees are in favor of the hybrid work model. So we, we, we're seeing the workforce extremely supportive into driving also the momentum behind uh, hybridization. We also know that to achieve a, a hybrid work model, it's no mean feat. There, is, there are three considerable targets inside, which you also talked about, Kay and, uh, and, and Lewis. It's about enabling uh, hybrid work it's also about empowering and engaging employees and your point, Kay, on, on making, you know, the office as a destination to, for, uh, you know, experience uh, and, and getting together will be uh, more important than ever. But also, uh, we need to keep in mind how we're going to manage and sustain dynamic occupancy planning. And, and Louis, you also, you know, touched, you know, on this. So what we're seeing is that a lot of the conversation at the moment are around this hybrid continuum. And we're observing that the conversation seems to start at a business level. They're really trying to address their business strategy, you know, how uh, they're viewing their new purpose as a business, uh, what is the, you know, the motto behind uh, attracting, uh, you know, talent. The second uh, uh, priority seems to then gravitate toward the people strategy. We're having more and more conversation with uh, human resources uh, and, uh, you know, CEOs about, you know, talent uh, acquisition and, 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 and attraction. We're also talking about health and well-being much more before we actually get into the conversation around the workplace, the physical environment itself so we can start looking at the, the right CRE strategy. And I think this reimagination you know, process to move toward the hybrid model will be uh, uh, extremely important. For me, like Kay, I strongly believe that we are looking at a future where a new purpose for the workplace is emerging. And we had a stage where we really need to pay great attention about how we're going to define the new purpose of workplace. We're starting to have very much a lot of clarity in terms of what it's going to look like. And this is, you know, the model that you have here on, on the right hand side. We know that it's going to be a place where you're going to recognize your brand. It's about brand experience. Also a place where culture and pride in belonging 
is going to be, you know, enhanced and exacerbated in a way. But we also know it's going to be a place to learn and socialize. The return to the office needs to have a strong purpose around socialization, collaboration, community life, more than we ever had, you know, before. And that's where that new definition of the purpose of the workplace comes into place. Great attention is being paid at the moment around the topic of health and well-being, and I'm sure we're all being extremely concerned about how things are going to evolve. But clearly, it's high on the agenda of uh, corporate uh, you know, clients at the moment. They are caring far more than they were you know, in the past, paying attention to the health and well-being of their workforce and wondering how they can get or win back their employees to return into a safe and uh, you know environment this is a very difficult psychological step for a lot of people and i think this is where most of the attention is being put at the moment we also know from a purpose you know point of view that the notion of engagement and experience is going to be very strong so we need to look at the future you know of work through the lens of the hybrid uh, continuum keeping in mind that the workforce are the one which are going to be the key drivers behind it. It's going to be a people-first leadership mindset in organization. We also know that um, the office will evolve into a destination for face-to-face -face interaction, collaboration, and socialization more than we had in the past. And we also know that, you know, as, as part of this, we need to help uh, corporate occupiers, employers, to decode the new purpose of office by defining how work is done today and how their workplace can support, you know, their workforce. So in a way, I think we all align, go moving into the same direction. Hybrid will be part of our future, how you unlock work from anywhere through the hybrid model is what is going to be the key priority I believe over the next uh, six to nine months before implementing physical transformation to the working environment. Thank you, uh, Marie, and thank you to the entire panel and uh, especially to Jeff also for downloading uh, some of these um, thoughts and conclusions from the expert survey. Um, let's just jump into the um, um, the poll, uh, quick, we have a poll for you. And if you could go in and, and open a browser into slide.do or slido.com, as you can see on the slide, you can also take your phone and and um, tap in the QR code. Uh, it will bring you directly into the, um, um, the browser window, into the website. And then you type in, in the top bar, uh, you type in T985. That is T985. That's the code for us for this particular webinar. And then we have a question for you that I think all of uh, our three panelists uh, also already alluded to. What is the main business driver for FM post vaccine? It will be really interesting to get your view and your input on this uh, based on what you've already heard uh, from our speakers. Um, and while while we drive into this, uh, keep keep the the questions coming in the comments field on the uh, right hand side. Uh, I already noted a, a comment from Randy Brown on social connectivity is key. So uh, so I think you're also agreeing with the panel uh, on this one that that is something that we need to focus more on. The whole objective of this, and especially the discussion we are having now, is to take some of these. Um, trends that we are seeing in the workplace and then driving it down to what this actually means for facility management and how we need to react to some of these inputs that we have heard uh, from uh, from the speakers so far. So uh, <clears throat> so as we can see, the answers are coming in and thanks so much for this. Um, it is pretty, uh, it's a pretty compelling uh, input we are getting and, and currently that there, there seems to be a some kind of a consensus view um, to this. So, um, Marie, um, this sort of fits uh, with what it you fits, were saying yeah. already. 
Yeah. It fits, yeah, I think, you know, the de development and deployment of a new workplace strategy. Clearly, this is where the main focus is at, at, at the moment. I think we, we're hearing a lot. We, we haven't seen yet the emergence of, like, um, large numbers of, of solution, uh, uh, you know, into real life. A lot of them are on paper uh, at, at the moment. Uh, I think second point, the focus on employee health and well-being. I'm sure, you know, Kay, you could also comment on that. I mean, this is... this is at the moment uh, um, uh, exponential. I have a quest on a, on a daily basis about the topic of health and wellness and how the workforce is going to be impacted. Um, and uh, we are actually going to do a specific research just on, you know, on this topic. Yeah, so, Maria, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll tag in here and say that in the US, we're a little bit behind Europe in activity-based working. And there's been a big debate here about, you know, because of COVID, should everybody have a dedicated spot, which, by the way, just so you know, anybody that has a dedicated work point, they are rarely cleaned. And so your desk is probably dirtier than a toilet. But, you know, that's that's a whole other topic. But what we're seeing right now is this realization that if we create this hybrid scenario and fewer people are coming into the office on a regular basis, we already have underutilized square footage. And so that would just get even more. And so a lot of our clients are coming to us right now and saying, okay, we're going to go in, we're going to do activity based or neighborhood based choice is what we actually advocate for. And we're going to create uh, this new way of working. And we need to develop strategies around mobility programs because we've been working from home for 20 or 30 years but very few companies have uh, solid programs and policies around who can and who can't and what does that mean and governments now are starting to mandate you know uh, if people are if you're going to require people from working from home maybe you should pay for their setup maybe you should pay portion of their rent maybe you should pay extra taxes to offset uh, what's going to happen to central business districts. So we're spending a lot of time on those new policies and procedures and new ways of working specifically around neighborhood-based choice environments when people return. Thanks. Luis, anything that surprises you on these answers? Um, no, actually no. And uh, I, I, I agree with Kay's and, and Dr. Marie's comments. I was going to say that precisely um, on the, in developing the workplace strategy, there's a big challenge. Um, in collaboration and in speed. Uh, businesses have to be fast to realize that all uh, business areas need to be involved, as I was mentioning. And and who's and also to answer the question, who's gonna guide that uh, um, designing of the strategy? Is it gonna be HR, is it gonna be the business, is it gonna be finance, is it gonna be the, the real estate organization within that business? So that, that's a, a good question to answer and to um, answer fast. And the other, the other challenge is speed. We need to realize that there needs to be this collaboration between all uh, business units, and, and and this comes precisely. It is interesting for for our audience because talking about FM, one of the good things of this uh, situation we are still living is that FM has come to the front point. You know, uh, FM previously sometimes, not always, but sometimes was perceived or thought as you know the backstage guys who make things work. Uh, but uh, with all these, uh, all the problems that the crisis uh, has uh, created, FM has come to front point as a uh, as a first line supporter, both of strategy, creating the strategy, and implementing the strategy. So, uh, uh, as soon as businesses realize they they have got to get together between different areas and uh, uh, design that uh, strategy, the better. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the input and, and thanks for the input also on the poll here. I'll, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, in all honesty, about cost containment and cost reductions. If we have asked these questions two years ago, I'm absolutely sure that would have been number one. So something is happening in the space that we're in, I think. And it, maybe it's not a bad thing. Maybe there's some kind of a silver lining to all this COVID-19 stuff. Let's well, actually, have, uh, 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 yeah, uh, I know. I also think that the focus on technology and digitization here is a little underestimated. Uh, again, if we can run this poll in September, October, you'll see that your investment around technology and digitization to enable hybrid work will be absolutely essential. But yeah, I think you can priority. say the same for sustainability and environmental yeah. yeah. ESGs. I'm also surprised that that's probably that's number 
No, but th that's the last uh, one here. So uh, like, yeah, you, yeah, you probably right. have a, uh, an opinion about that. No, yes. I was going to say that to your comment about costs, uh, um, Peter. I think we, we all went into a panic mode. Of, I mean, uh, naturally panic mode in during 2020 to, to see where we needed to, to you know, efficientize and, and cut costs and, and, and make the business, the business profitable. But as we go deeper into the crisis or we're trying to get out of the crisis, I think the, the shift is going to be how do we better use that money? How do we better... Um, support this strategy we're talking about with, with, with resources, more efficient, better thought, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And and let's leave the conversation here because we've got a, plenty of more questions. Uh, so we could discuss uh, this the entire uh, the entire day here. But let's, let's jump into the first quest, question to the panel. What workplace entities <clears throat> are setting the strategic priorities in the organization that you are working with or you are advising on a daily basis? Uh, Kay, how, how do you see this? What yeah. are you doing in the UK? Everyone, all right? And, and that's actually a good thing because not everyone did have a seat at the table before, but CEOs are very, very involved right now in what is happening. And HR is playing a much, much larger role because I think what we're seeing is this massive shift to the realization that people are your biggest cost. And so, Peter, going back to that last thing, you know, if 80% of your money is going to your people and you're worried about their health and well-being right now, you're not as worried about, uh, you know, maybe some of the facilities. And I, I think that's why that shift is happening is there's this new focus on uh, the human centric approach. Mm. But K, okay, people are also your your, your biggest, uh, you know, uh, capital, your assets. Um, and, and 2020, certainly the reliance on people and human um, uh, was feasible without uh, a physical location to support it. I mean, yeah, but you could already work from home. So but, but I think uh, we, I think we still need to figure out what has this done to people. I mean, the number uh, of women in the workplace has now dropped back forty years. Forty yeah. years. We have lost forty years of progress, and people are at an all-time. Uh, uh, depression is at an all-time high. One in four teenagers is, is contemplating suicide. I mean, the, the, the effects of this on people is absolutely staggering. And I want to go back to one of the other questions that was asked. There are a lot of people that can't work from home or quite frankly shouldn't or couldn't or are. It's actually dangerous for them. And that 70% of employees that favor the hybrid model, that's driven on people that actually could go to an office and have a choice. There are parts of the world where less than 15% of the entire working population even goes to an office to begin with. They don't have that choice. They are all either frontline workers or exposed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think we need to really think about the ramifications that this has on a societal impact. This is having a devastating impact yeah. on certain portions of our population. Just to jump in right now, you've you, you, in high income countries, you have 60% of the labor market that cannot work from home. 40% can. And during the crisis, that's been activated. So now you're having, in economic terms, what we call a K-formed recovery, meaning one ha one part of the population, those who could work from home, have been largely largely untouched by the crisis, and then the rest getting you know just absolutely hammered. So right now, the ILO came out, International Labor Organization, uh, 225 million people have lost their jobs. Um, because of the crisis worldwide. So you're talking four times as many people um, have been negatively affected as the financial mm -hmm. crisis. So this is a long, tough journey. And most of those are women or people of color. Exactly. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. It's it's what we call the long tail yeah. of COVID. You know, that tail is going to be with us for decades. Uh, and as you say, we've lost, you know, we went back 40 years uh, uh, around, uh, uh, you know, employment for, for women. It may take us, you know, another 60 years to catch up with this, if not, uh, you know, longer. So, yes, that second disaster, um, uh, which is the bubble created by COVID, uh, you know, the long haul of COVID is going to be uh, catastrophic. And we've got to pay attention to it now. Well, that, that brings on another uh, another question that also comes um, uh, from the audience here, Jim Rouse and Jules Horse. 
you know, are, are asking questions about, you know, this new relationship that facility management need to establish with HR, with IT, with the whole change management agenda to activate the workplace and also bring these new agendas in that we begin to discuss them as part of the business and as part of, you know, how do we actually bring people not only back um, to the office, but how do we bring, you know, minorities, women, other areas uh, of the workforce back into that community that we are part of? Because of, but part of the reason of, of this is also that, you know, we've been locked down in this situation that we have now, and it has forced us to make some of these choices right. But now as we enter into that post-pandemic world, um, we are getting back to some kind of a new normal where we can bring that back, back into play. Uh, but I think we need to do that wisely and, and in close collaboration with HR. A any comments on, on this? Yeah, um, I, would, I would just say that the, this, the pandemic has shown a light on other issues and it's really kind of brought some things, you know, the systemic um, injustice that we have in hiring and how you know, women are typically paid less and women are typically in, you know, a certain type of job that were the ones that were let go or they still tend to be the primary caregivers. I mean, that's why those numbers are happening. And that's not a, you know, COVID didn't do that. That's been around for a long time. It's just, it, it's just shining a light on some of those uh, other things that we've been dealing with for a long time and kind of ignoring, quite frankly. I, I, I would add in there, I mean, I, I agree completely with, with the comments, but I would I lay there two, two perspectives. One is that these uh, social topics are much more important and are in the spotlight uh, much more than in the past years. Uh, I mean, the, the events in the US last year brought up uh, a lot of initiatives within uh, businesses. CBRE, for example, appointed a, a chief diversity officer. Um, diversity, equity and inclusion has become a priority for the business. So. Uh, on the on the, trying to see it from a positive way, uh, side, uh, there are all these trends or or, or, or uh, bad things you, you're mentioning, Kay and, and Dr. Marie. But there are, there's also much more spotlight on that. And the, the second thought was or is technology democratizes things. That, that's a good thing. Technology makes things uh, more easier and more accessible to everyone. So, for example. Uh, people or, or talent that couldn't be hired before because they couldn't go to the big city centers, New York, San Francisco, et cetera, they will be able to get into the workforce now thanks to uh, technology. Uh, so I, I think they, I think we, we're right now in the, in the middle of a, a, a pendulum, you know, we're, not, we're an extreme, we need to go to the center, bring big people back and then start thinking, hey, what does our people, what do our people want to, uh, leave in the office and how do you want to work together hey and, peter i think we should play a game i think we should because we only have 15 minutes left and we have a ton of questions even that we were going to ask ourselves let alone i think we should do rapid fire 30 yeah. second responses or less and louise marie and marie can we do it we can do it right if yeah. you haven't okay. prepared before right. yes do it rapid fire. Right. let's uh, cool cool okay thanks uh, yeah that can i jump fun. in let's with the rapid fire yeah yeah, Jeff, really jump quick, in and 30 seconds. <laughs> take a little bit, a little bit more out of the clock. <laughs> yeah, one quick question, uh, one, one quick comment. We have reason to be optimistic. One aspect is because we haven't been able to do anything for the last nine to 10 months, savings have never been higher and people are desperate to do things. So once the vaccine ha you know, comes in, has some effects, reduces some of the transmission It's going to be rate. a hell of a party. Exactly, and people, and that's what you're. We're going to be seeing. It's not going to be a full recovery. It's going to be a rebound. So we got to give some uh, uh, optimism there. And Funny, roaring twenties. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. You know, let's your cycle the again. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's jump into uh, because the the budgeting question I think is is important, and I think a lot of facility managers are sitting trying to wrap their head around. You know, how, what, what do we do with this? So. So quick, rapid fire uh, answers. What recommendations would you provide to facility managers in this ongoing budget discussion that we are in at the moment? Old answer would have been cleaning, but now we know that we're over cleaning and that very little of is transmitted that way. New answer is technology that enables low to no touch, better experiences and gives people options and control. 
Thanks, yeah, Marie. And I, I would add to this that, uh, you know, bringing the technology to give you real time, you know, data and, and build a team to enable you to uh, drive proper data analytics to get down to the metrics that matter to really, you know, abandon occupancy, uh, you know, metrics, move towards health, well-being, uh, you know, being uh, being fit for the future, future fit real estate. I think that's where the budget needs to be put in. Thanks, Luis. Uh, I obviously share both comments. I would say look at the big picture and make sure you're engaging the, uh, the right stakeholders to, to be able to imagine and plan for that big picture. And also don't look at the pennies. You know, look at the big stuff, strategic big stuff, long trends, and plan for the future. Don't plan for the uh, short term, mm -hmm. trying to just uh, drive down costs because of the crisis. Good point. The penny wise and pound foolish, I think that's a uh, that has been a headline for facility managers for years. Um, Jeff, what did, yeah. do the experts say about this? Well, you know, you're going to see a lot of shifts from uh, real estate, as we've been talking about, to digital experiences. Um, also, uh, investing into different AI technologies to be exactly more precise to the knowledge that, that actually matters and move things. Also, that question about um, the hands-free, touch-free shift towards that as well. Um, so all of these things are very much in line with the comments from, from the Delphi study. One of the aspects where I don't think we've been talk, touching enough upon is the discussion about the efficiency improvements and the whole sustainability agenda. We saw in our poll, that's a question that needs to be discussed. And there's also some behaviors that we haven't been really taking into account because we've been running uh, HVAC systems and things like that for empty buildings not really uh, a cost-effective manner of doing things. And Increased these are some of these. PPE, single, yeah. single driver commutes yeah. to work, nobody wants to take mass transit, all, you know, pre-packaged everything. Yes, all these ready, things. Ready, aim, fire. Okay, let's yep. uh, move to the next <laughs> question. <laughs> thanks, thanks for all the input. Great, great uh, short comments. One of the things that we are dealing with now is the home working from home setup, and and Kay, you already alluded to that. So did Marie and others. You know, what is this work from home or work from anywhere, remote work, whatever we're going to call it? What type of I home think, services are you seeing that organizations offering, and what do they have to offer in the future? It's let's very start broad. with the yes. Let's we'll start with uh, Marie. Thanks. Uh, it's it's very broad. I think it ranged from you know having a a, a, a kit. Uh, you know, package delivered at home to an allowance and, and through uh, having more specific services around babysitting, uh, delivering hot meals at home, uh, you know, coach, uh, personal coaching. Uh, I mean, everything which actually enable work, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and make the experience of work less daunting when you are stuck at home. Uh, with all the difficulties this is having at the moment around family life, uh, you know, schools at home and, 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 and so on. So I think very broad range, more sophisticated, more personalized and uh, activated through technology. This is the type of services that we've got. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? What do you think? What are you seeing here? Oh, one, you know, you've you've seen that, you know, what we've seen is like most remote workers uh, weren't prepared for this uh, when they got kicked into it. So all of them were, you know, pulling out uh, pockets to out of pocket to buy the the amenities that they need to have to work from home. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, we're not geared to be working remotely, or most remote workers are. So the switch over to a hybrid model needs a retrofit of our apartments, our housing things like that to accommodate that. So the question is, you know, how do we do this? And if companies are you know, spending 11,000 annually on average per employee to work at the office, how is that pot going to be redistributed to support workers to work in these alternative environments? And I think it's not just what's legally required. There's going to be a competition among workers, I'm um, sorry, among companies, especially when we talk about the talent equation, about how will they support people? So there are going to be many of the attributes that Marie talks about as well. Thanks, Luis. So I think there's going to be a big player, which is legislation. You know, uh, governments are going to be saying uh, what businesses are, are going to be paying for, and that's going to be depend on the, each country. Uh, EMEA or Europe is traditionally more uh, um, approaches, uh, uh, how do you say it? Uh, um, uh, uh, more support or, or, or likes more support from the employee, uh, the Americas perhaps, 
are more liberal in that way. So, so th th that's a big player we need to watch. And then uh, I think that there's going to be, as as, as Marie, uh, Dr. Marie was, was saying, there's going to be a big focus on wellness and what FMs are going to be in charge of precisely making sure uh, our people are good, are well, are healthy, uh, mentally healthy. And also uh, are they going to be in charge of, of all the infrastructure to support this support sorry for the reasons so if 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 uh, businesses are going to be provide uh, economics or they're going to be paying for internet or etc well the all the the fms are going to be uh, also big players in there and and k the last comment on this yeah i'll just add one real quick thing uh, i don't advocate that you sit in one place at your workplace all day i don't advocate that you do it at home uh, people are talking about ergonomics. You know, it's starting to kick in now. People are starting to have lots of pains from sitting in one place all day. Move. That is your best thing that you can do and sit in different options in different places throughout the day. All right. Uh, last questions to this uh, Radio Aim Fire model. And we'll have a last poll question and then we'll wrap up. But to the panel here, what are what technology platforms are you seeing transforming the end user experience? And, and you have, have you found any examples that will be interesting for us and the audience to follow. Luis, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Uh, well, I would I would mention uh, hosting uh, um, technology, hosting applications to make the, uh, the the flow of the of the employee, you know, uh, very easy. We've mentioned commuting. We've mentioned uh, uh, making reservations. We've made, we've mentioned food delivery. So, all the hosting uh, applications, uh, I think they're going to be. Uh, Big players are really important, and uh, uh, as an example, I will put uh, CBRE. So CBRE has a, a technology solution uh, called Host. So uh, I'll mention that one. <laughs> you would be remiss if you didn't, Marie. I think you probably have the same kind of plug for Jet. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've been developing our own app called called Jet, but we're not the only one. I think there's the, the solution of having everything, you know, on your mobile phone and the ability to or the services to get things um, more, more integrated as part of your day-to-day -day life is enabled through this piece of technology. So I think that, that, that the big part of the development is around this piece of tech or a tablet, uh, which will be part of uh, you know, the, the, the kit, uh, which potentially can be uh, uh, um, subsidized by your, by your organization. But uh, yeah, I will bet, I would bet on apps. All right. And, and Kay, does uh, HOK have something similar? It, no, we don't. So you, you guys can own, own all that, but we advocate that, that our clients <laughs> have that. Uh, but we are creatives and we want to get together and we want to share. So we're using a lot of concept board right now where we can kind of share things out there. And there's a whole plethora of new technologies that are be, that are going to come out that are going to challenge Zoom and WebEx to really kind of take what we're doing right now to the next, next level and allow more visible engagement and writing and commenting and sharing materials more actively. So that's what's coming next. And if I may, Kay, I really like what uh, Hawk and uh, you, uh, you guys are doing about neurodiversity uh, and, uh, and how you. offices, designing offices support that, that, that stuff. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's just jump to the, uh, the last poll. Uh, again, go to Slido. Um, Type in T985, and, and there are some questions here. And as we can see the responses coming in, uh, the, the, the big question here is what will be the main responsibility for facility management post-vaccine? Uh, and I think these are some really some interesting opportunities. You have to choose one. I know many of us will probably like to choose a series of these answers, but if you can choose only one, what will it be? So as the uh, responses come in, uh, any comment to this, Jeff? What did you expect to see? Yeah, um, one second. I'm just getting my uh, figures up. Uh, so yeah, no, I'm expecting to see some aspects around, um, um, do, 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 yeah, the health and well-being, health and safety of the workplace is one of the ones that's uh, the critical one. That was the one that banged through in the in the Delphi. But it's interesting to see what they have here. I think something's evolved since the Delphi survey was done, and I think oh, it's course. the realization, and it's been happening over years. But we would say that the role of the facility manager is shifting from being about managing 
the building to managing the community because if say, people aren't coming to your building there is nothing to manage and more and more of that is being automated but right now the number one role is creating a compelling enough environment and an amazing experience that gives people something different that they actually even want to be there I, uh, hey good 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 point, yeah. but I got to say that there's there was a big split in the group on this because to uh, to manage those automated buildings requires some hardcore specialist competencies that you can't ignore. Well, you have a right? management side, so there's a big debate going on on this, and I think no. the future is to be decided uh, on that. I would say I would, more than shifting, I would say expanding. Uh, yeah. FMs are not going to leave behind all that hard stuff you me you're mentioning, uh, Jeff. But they are going to expand towards what precisely uh, Kay was mentioning, you know, uh, experience, etc. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to stop the debate here. Uh, there were so many questions that we didn't have a chance to go through. Uh, maybe we can take some of them up at one of the next uh, um, webinars that we are hosting. Thank you to Kay, Marie, Louise, and Jeff for, uh, for being part of the panel and sharing your experience and insights. And thanks for all the questions and input from the audience. Uh, we have another webinar again on the 14th of February, uh, where Kate North, Luke Camperman, and Eric Johnson will discuss the importance of engaging the organization's HR professionals into the workplace reentry and corporate real estate and FM discussions. So I think that would be quite interesting as well. Again, you can find all episodes and a ton of material at the IFMA Coronavirus Resource Center. A website at uh, ifma.org. So watch this space as we communicate new webinars and continue to share a lot of new content. So with this, back to thank you, Chris. Hey, thanks so much, Peter. And yes, like Peter said, huge thank you to the panelists. Um, as we saw on this uh, webinar, there's obviously a lot to discuss with this topic and a lot to unpack. So we will have future episodes. As I mentioned at the top of the session, please, if you haven't done so, subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the notification bell, and that way you'll be alerted to future episodes. Um, and yes, you can go to ifma.org slash coronavirus, and we'll put up the full slide deck of this presentation and the recording. Uh, so be sure to check that out, and we'll see you on the next one.